Well, it is such uh, an immense privilege to preach a part of the Bible that has the purpose that we have just affirmed together, that in believing these things, we may have life in the name of Jesus. I want to begin this morning by telling you about what I think is a very uh, exciting art project coming to our campus. This school year, Leah Samuelson and some of her students are learning an ancient craft under the direction of true masters, they are learning the art of making mosaics. And later this year, this is one uh, medieval example, later this year a large mosaic will take shape in the lobby outside of Barrow's Auditorium. Uh, we had wanted to have some work of art there that communicated the mission of the Graham Center, which is a mission of global evangelism. We wanted something that would celebrate sharing the gospel. But the BGC, as you may know, is also the home of the Wheaton College Graduate School, and so we wanted it to reflect some of our priorities for graduate education, biblical studies, historical theology, intercultural communication, spiritual formation, the care of people from broken homes. It's, it's a lot to ask, one work of art to do all of that. But I believe our new mosaic will do all of that and more because its theme is a biblical, cross-cultural, theological dialogue from the Gospel of John that starts with a woman on the margins of society and really ends with the Gospel going out to the nations. It's about the life-giving conversation between Jesus and the woman at the well. We hope uh, maybe already in October to unveil the design of the new mosaic. I'll give you a couple of examples of this theme in the history of art uh, during the message this morning. But I want us to look very carefully and clearly at each of the two people in this dialogue and in doing so also come to a deeper understanding of ourselves. Do you see this woman? for who she is, this woman who met Jesus on this very hot day? And will you regard her and people like her the way that Jesus did? One reason to look at her very carefully is because some of the things that people have said about this woman over the centuries aren't actually in the text, but come instead from their assumptions or speculations. We don't know the woman's name, but we certainly are fascinated by her story. The first thing the Bible says about her is that she is a woman, and immediately that heightens the dramatic tension. Jesus is alone with an unknown woman. And already the sexual differentiation that cuts through humanity opens up all sorts of possibilities, maybe introduces some problems the way that relationships between men and women often do. Apparently, it was unusual in this cultural context for a man and a woman who didn't know each other to engage in this kind of ongoing conversation. We know this from the way that the disciples react when they return from this errand that they run to the village. They marveled that Jesus was talking with a woman. Now, presumably by this point, they had seen Jesus speaking with many women, but not privately the way that he was talking with this woman. And it raised all kinds of questions, even if they didn't voice them out loud, at least to Jesus. What, what does this woman want? Why is Jesus talking with her? These are some of the questions. We also know that she is a Samaritan, a woman from Samaria, the Bible says. And that simple statement multiplies the drama exponentially because now what is at stake in this conversation is not merely gender, but also ethnicity and religion. And you have to remember that this story takes place in a part of the world where conflicts that started millennia ago are still in living memory. In fact, the, the story opens by telling us that we are at the very well that the, the patriarch Jacob had given to his favored son Joseph thousands of years earlier, and yet it's almost as if it happened yesterday from the conversation that takes place. You may know that in those days there was a lot of bad blood between the Jews and the Samaritans. To some extent it was a family feud, 
The Samaritans traced their heritage back to Ephraim and Manasseh, two of the 12 tribes of Israel. Many of them, though, had intermarried with Canaanites, and yet they were still cousins of the Jews. There was a family relationship. And the conflict was religious, as we will see from the dialogue, and also political. I think it helps to know that when Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians, and the people of Judah were carried off in exile to Baghdad, this was about six centuries before Christ, many Samaritans took advantage of the opportunity and moved into Jerusalem. And when the Jews returned from their exile 70 years later, the Samaritans, many of them, desperately tried to prevent their return. It was something the Jewish people never forgot. And it explains, I think, the astonished question that the woman asks in verse 9, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? And for those who don't know the full context, John adds an editorial comment, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Here is something else we know about this woman, if we will really look at her, apart from her gender, her ethnicity, and her religion. I think we know that life has not been kind to her, especially family life. We find this out when Jesus tests her with a simple command in verse 16, go call your husband and come here. The woman gives a true reply as far as it goes, but it doesn't volunteer very much information. I have no husband, she answers, but as the divine son of God, Jesus knows the back story. And so he says, I think not unkindly, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you said is true. Now, some people, when they read this, assume that the Samaritan woman had divorced one husband after another and was now living in sin with some guy she had just met. Or maybe that she was a serial adulteress, and the reason, maybe you've heard this, she went to the well in the middle of the day, was, which is not when most people went, is because she was some kind of social outcast. And yet, everything we actually know about the ancient Near East makes those assumptions highly unlikely. Women married young in those days, usually to older men. Just think of Mary and Joseph. Life expectancy was much lower back then. It was common for women to become widows, even at a young age. Younger widows typically remarried. Think of Ruth and Boaz. Divorce was not especially uncommon in those days, but importantly, it could only be initiated by a man, a husband perhaps, or a woman's father. It it really makes it extremely doubtful, we know of nothing like this in the ancient world, that the Samaritan woman had divorced five husbands and just as unlikely that five different men would have married her if she had a bad reputation. All of this is complicated by the fact that in the time of Christ, only Roman citizens had the full legal rights of marriage. And so common law marriage, as we might refer to it, was common. A couple might agree to a dowry or they might not, but in any case, they wouldn't have a marriage license the way that we have them today. And so when this woman had set up house with a man who was not her husband, she may have been in a socially acceptable relationship, even if that relationship didn't measure up to the Bible's high standard for holy matrimony. Now, let me just say, incidentally, a great place to learn, all, learn more about all of this. I've just very briefly summarized, but this, this narrative is so commonly misunderstood, it seemed important to go into it. Um, but Lynn Coick from our, uh, from our own New Testament faculty has written an excellent book about women in the world of the earliest Christians. And then let me just digress further to say what, how privileged we are on this campus to have such gifted women teaching Bible and theology. Uh, Dr. Kowick is just one example of that. And 
you, one of the places you see the value of that is in sometimes a more careful understanding of a narrative uh, like this one. So where does all of this background leave us? I think needing to be careful about assuming that this Samaritan woman was especially immoral. We really don't know. Very likely, more than one of her husbands had died. Possibly there had been a divorce, maybe more than one, although even if there was, we don't know who was at fault. We just really don't know the full situation. This woman was like a lot of people we meet. We can see that they have suffered, and we sense that if we want to know their life story, we're going to need to sit down and get comfortable because they have a lot to tell. I think we do know this, however. Life had not been kind to this woman. And whether she had left her husbands at graveside or lost them in divorce court, she had suffered the incredible trauma of seeing five marriages come to an end. Maybe she was suffering for some of her sins, as maybe all of us do. Maybe not. Maybe she was more sinned against than sinning. But whatever the story was, her life had not been easy. And there is one more thing I want you to see about this woman, particularly because she hasn't always been treated so kindly by Bible teachers. She was seeking spiritual truth which I think is one of the highest compliments that we could ever pay anyone. As this dialogue unfolds, we discover that this woman is aware of her community's religious beliefs. She engages in spiritual conversation. She's a good listener. She asks great questions. For example, when Jesus offers her living water, she quickly asks how perceptive it is if he is claiming to be greater than Jacob, her forefather in the faith. She has an inquiring mind as well as a thirsty soul. And as soon as she perceives that Jesus is a prophet, she wants to get an answer to one of the questions that she has been thinking about. Where is the right place to worship the living God? And notice that she even believes in the promise of a coming Savior. She says to Jesus, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. And she knows this as well, that when this Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. What, what a remarkable confession of faith this is, especially for a Gentile before the coming of Christ. This woman's heart was prepared. She was about as much a believer as anyone could be in those days. And a little later on in the story, you, you sense the expectancy in her voice as she says to her neighbors, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And I think if we are wise, we will follow her advice and we will see the man who told her all she ever did. It's important to see this woman in this passage and see her for who she is, but even more important to see Jesus for who he is. Because if you meet the Savior at the well, your soul will be deeply satisfied. We've been singing about it together already this morning, all who are thirsty. This remarkable conversation comes to a point of intense, dramatic irony at the end of verse 25, where the woman tells the Messiah what will happen when the Messiah comes. Wouldn't you love to see the expression on her face when he says, I who speak to you am he? The stranger at the well turned out to be the savior of the world. And what do we see about him? Jesus reaches across everything that divides so that we can have a relationship with him. You could hardly find two people that seem to be more different, one a man, the other a woman, one a Jew, the other a Gentile, in fact, a Samaritan, one with all kinds of questions, the other with all the answers, one some kind of sinner, but the other the perfect son of God. People sometimes say that opposites attract, but 
My experience is that when it comes to human relationships, such polar magnetism can have its limits. And incidentally, the dramatic differences between these two people, I think, effectively prove that this conversation really happened. This isn't the kind of story anyone in first century Israel would have written unless it actually took place. And what took place is that Jesus reached across every barrier to bring this woman into the embrace of his love. And none of the things that divide people, race, gender, nationality, religion, any kind of need or spiritual brokenness, none of that presents any obstacle to the love of God. How important that is for us, because there may be many things that we feel may separate us from the love of God, but the Son of God has come into the world to unite us to himself and in doing so to unite us to one another. Here is why Jesus came to end racial strife and ethnic violence, to bring men and women together and to satisfy the desire of every thirsty soul. What will Jesus do when he reaches into every part of your life and then empowers you to reach into the lives of others. I think when we see Jesus sitting at the well, we should really almost see him sitting down with us. Whoever we are, whatever we have done wrong, whatever loneliness we feel, whatever we have lost or suffered, Jesus is reaching out to make us the friends of God. And importantly, he does this knowing exactly who we are. He's under no misconceptions at all. And that's something very important also to see about our Savior. His supernatural knowledge, it's, it's evident that he's a real human being. That's why he's tired. It's why he's thirsty. The scripture says, wearied as he was from his travels and everything else. And yet, he also has a divine knowledge. The woman could hardly believe that this total stranger knew her life story. Having five or six husbands is hardly common knowledge to a total stranger. And she reached, I think, the correct conclusion. If Jesus knew all of that, he must know everything about her. She describes him as the man who told her all that she ever did. I said earlier that these two people were strangers, but I guess really that's only half correct. She, she may not have recognized him yet, but he knew her already. And what a mystery that is. The divine omniscience of the incarnate Son of God. And what a mystery it is in our own life that Jesus knows everything there is to know about us, which probably includes a lot of things we wish he didn't know, the things we hope other people certainly won't find out. But if we are wise, like the woman at the well, we will see this as something to celebrate us, celebrate, because if it's true that the Savior knows all about us, it, knows, it means that he knows the worst about us, but he does not stop loving us. He loves us as we are in order to make us by grace the people that we may yet become. You might think about it like this. If there were things that Jesus didn't know about you, then you would have to be self-protective. You, you would always be afraid that he would find those things out and then maybe he would stop loving you. But if he already knows all of that and loves you anyway, there is nothing to hide and no reason to fear. This is the savior we see at the well. One who reaches out across everything that divides. One who knows us and loves us. And also someone who knows all the answers. And that's something to see here as well. How many deep truths of the faith are explained in this passage. This is definitely one of those chapters of scripture to revisit and contemplate in, in greater depth. Here Jesus explains the gift of eternal life. He shows the difference between true and false worship. He identifies himself as the promised savior. And at every point in the conversation, he is always one step ahead 
which I think explains why the woman keeps asking him all kinds of questions. She's never met anyone who made this much sense. Now, maybe you have some questions of your own. I wonder what, if you could ask God any question today, what would it be? You may have questions about God himself, about heaven and hell, about evil and injustice, about why God does what he does or doesn't do some of the things that you wish he would, and including whatever he has or hasn't done in your own life. Recently, I spoke with a Wheaton parent whose son graduated and moved far away to pursue his professional dreams. And she spoke with some concern because he's going through a heavy season of spiritual doubt. She knows that's normal for Christians. She's hopeful about where he'll end up. But she said that she really wished that he had spent more time working on those questions when he was still at Wheaton and had all kinds of spiritual and theological resources to draw on, particularly among our faculty. But you know, in the end, the best resource we have is Jesus himself, the best of all teachers, the source of all wisdom, the all-knowing Son of God. You know, if you live in an academic community and do a lot of thinking, including critical thinking, sometimes you get to the point where Biblical orthodoxy doesn't seem very sophisticated. You're looking for answers that are as complex as some of your questions. But in all of that, don't overlook the incredibly obvious. If Jesus really is the Son of God and Savior of the world, if he really is, as he says he is, the way, the truth, and the life, then he is both the first place and the last place to look when you need some answers. And so whatever hard questions you're still working on, listen to Jesus. That's the example that the Samaritan woman sets for us this morning. The main answer he wants to give is himself. And often when we really accept Jesus as he is, then we can be content to wait for the answers he wants to give us. This Savior who is reaching out to us, who knows us, who loves us, who has all the answers, he is the only one who can ever satisfy our soul. This conversation began with a simple request for cool water from a deep well. And when the woman challenged the request, Jesus turned the tables on her and said, look, if you knew the gift of God and if you knew who was saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Truth be told, the wrong person was asking for water in this story. And then when she finally did ask, she she asked for the wrong kind of water. She, She thought Jesus was talking about physical water Living water, a phrase used in those days to distinguish between still water, as you might find in a well, and flowing water coming from a natural spring. But Jesus had a deeper metaphor in mind, touching on the mystery of salvation. He was talking about a spiritual water, water for the soul that would bring lasting satisfaction and Of course, in saying this, he was really just talking about himself. Oh, this this water here, drink that, you're going to be thirsty again. But drink of the water I give you, you will never be thirsty again. That water will be like a spring within you welling up to eternal life. Jesus is offering himself to us as the source of all satisfaction. Do you believe this? I tell you, the people of that village believed it. At the end of the story, they reached the conclusion that John wants all of us to reach in reading his gospel. We know that this is indeed the savior of the world. When you see the woman at the well, it helps you see Jesus. When you see Jesus, and here's the thought I wanna leave you with, I think you also see the kind of person God is calling you to become. This is for sure a story about who Jesus is, what he does, what he wants to teach. But I think it's also a story about what he wants us to do. And that's 
what we'll, we hope will happen with the mosaic down at the Billy Graham Center. People will look at that, that mosaic. They will see Jesus speaking with the woman at the well. They will certainly see in some way the kind of savior that he is, but our hope is they will also be inspired to do kingdom work, the work of Jesus in the world, whether they are theologians or Bible scholars or teachers or counselors or evangelists, all of the kinds of things that we are training people to do, particularly in the grad school. The savior at the well is calling you to enter into his mission, to, to reach out to people who are different. Where gender and ethnicity and religion divide, we have an opportunity, more than an opportunity, a priority for relationship, for friendship, for spiritual conversation, for sharing the good news of Jesus. I wonder, where is the place of ministry in your life this year where you will really know people and as you come to know them, reach out to them with the Savior's love. And what, what burden will you carry for the nations, for, for people who are lost in this world and, and maybe without the gospel lost forever? You know, what seemed to excite Jesus the most in this story was the hope of an abundant harvest. Well, he was talking with his disciples as they were debriefing what had happened at the well. He, he looked up and already he could see crowds of people starting to come towards him, walking through the, through the fields. And as he looked at them, he said to his disciples, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes, see that the fields are white for harvest. And all of that was happening through the witness of one woman who saw Jesus for who he was, and when she did, she wanted other people to see him for who he was as well. And I believe that when we lift up our eyes and look up from this conversation in the Gospel of John, we will see the same thing that Jesus saw. The whole world is ready for spiritual harvest, a harvest of souls for the kingdom of God. And what the Lord of that harvest tells us to do is to pray that God will raise people up like the woman at the well who turned out to be not just a spiritual seeker, but one of the best, most effective evangelists in the Bible. I love what, what John says about her in verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of that woman's testimony. And I would love for someone someday to say the same thing about you. I believe in Jesus because you helped me to see Jesus. Let's turn our hearts to prayer as we close this morning. Let me invite you to take just a moment to reflect on the Savior's love for you. And as we reflect on your love, Lord, even for us, we want to pray for the grace to bear the message of living water to the thirsty souls around us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.